In the five categories of impact on human societies, the climate change will bring certainly more risk on tropical cyclones. The uniqueness of that cyclone Narcis a year ago was that it never occurred in the lower part of the Gulf of Bengal, rarely. And it usually moved west to Minister Hassan's country rather than moving east to, to Myanmar. But it did on that day. And people were, I guess, a bit complacent about any warning that was given out. So risk of tropical cyclones is certainly increasing in the tropical area. Floods, we have seen more floods, more frequent floods, and uh, more devastation because of the floods. We have seen landslides because of the floods, because habitat, human habitats are also in the hilly areas, and it's all of Southeast Asia we have problems of landslide. Droughts, it's irony that you have floods and you have droughts, and right now, in most of Southeast Asia, you can't even predict the season anymore. Droughts come when it's supposed to rain. Rain comes when it's supposed to be a dry season. And then the sea level rise. It is estimated that the entire countries of the Philippines will be affected, of course. The Mekong Delta region of Vietnam will be tremendously affected. All of Cambodia, strangely enough. The north and northeast of Laos, because of the change and impact on the forests, Bangkok River Basin, or the Japaya River Basin, West Sumatra, South Sumatra, West Java, East Java, Indonesia, among the most vulnerable. Now, when the sea, sea level rises, most populated area will be affected, not only the Irrawaddy River, Delta, as we have seen by Cyclone Nargis, and we are trying to keep people there. But if we are not careful, the impact of climate change will be on a lot of cities on the coastal areas of uh, Southeast Asia. These are the areas that will certainly induce human migration in the future. And that has to be an issue that all of us have to be concerned about because it is an issue of human insecurity. So this is uh, 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 an overall picture of what is happening. And there is no doubt anymore that climate change is certainly impacting on migration, on human migration. And if we are not careful about 2050, probably will be more than 200 million moving around. And we will have to carry the burden of those people on our communities. Thank you. Sirin, thank you so much. Thank you for giving us a regional picture and also for bringing us back to the starting point of this discussion, which is the impact of these unpredictable hazards, to use John Holmes's term, on longer term issues like migration. I'm going to hand over to you guys very soon to quit our panelists. But before I do so, can I please use the moderator's right to put in a question? And that is, what is the trade-off or what is the tension between putting money into making communities more resilient now, adaptation, versus inevitable migration? Is migration on the kind of scale that Serene was just talking about inevitable, therefore, if we do try and make communities more resilient? Or do we have to do a bit of one and still expect the other? John. I think we have to do both. Uh, I mean, inevitably, because climate change is already well launched and whatever is agreed in Copenhagen will be with us for the next 50, 100 years, um, the, the effects of the, the, the greenhouse gases that are there now, we know the sea level is going to rise. We know that glaciers are going to melt further. And there's actually virtually nothing we can do about that. So that itself will cause migration. Uh, you know, as we were hearing this morning, some small island states will disappear or half disappear. Parts of Bangladesh will become very difficult to live in. Parts of many other, uh, most countries in the world. 
uh, will suffer some kind of land loss from sea level rise, and that is going to cause migration. And there's relatively little we can do about that. Uh, I mean, there are also... We we're pushing all this money into trying to make uh, those communities wait. more resilient. Well, but, <laughs> there, are, but there, are, there are other disasters uh, which, again, we cannot stop, but where the actual impact we can reduce enormously. I mean, the effect of cyclones, I mean, it's what we've just been discussing, or the effect of flooding or the effect of drought. We may not be able to, well, we cannot prevent the drought or the cyclones or the flooding, but we can make sure that their impact on, on the, the populations in those areas are much less than they would be if we did nothing. So that's why it's worth spending the money, creating the resilience, doing the reforestation, which has, of course has other climatic benefits as well, uh, doing the water management techniques, replanting the mangrove swamps. You know, there's a whole series of things you can do, some of which are not necessarily hugely expensive. Preparedness and early warning systems don't have to be hugely expensive, some of which are more expensive, like reforestation in, in a place like Haiti where you need to replant virtually the whole country. Um, that's where the money is, that's where the effort needs to be made, and that's where the impact can be made. So others like... Uh, sea level rise will have some effects on the coastlines which we cannot really prevent. But the, even there, as we were discussing this morning, you, you need to take the actions to think about what you're going to do with the population. Where are they going to go? I mean, it's not evident to me in Bangladesh that there's you know, um, enough land to settle 30 million more people um, and so on. Um, so you need to deal with that before it happens. Think about it well before it happens. What, we need to think also about what status do they have? What is a climate refugee? What does it mean? Are they the same as refugees from conflict? Uh, no, I don't think they are. Or at least they're not covered by the same conventions at the moment. Do we need another convention? How are we going to deal with them? What status will they have if they cross borders? And there's a whole lot of things we need to prepare, and we need to do that now because these things are beginning to happen. Yes, indeed. Mr. Mahmoud, um, is it inevitable that you're going to have refugees on this kind of scale that we've been hearing from the IOM and elsewhere? Is Bangladesh basically going to end up shrinking to nothing? Indeed, I mean, uh, the environmental changes we cannot avert um, uh, immediately. So that's why, I mean, environmental refugees, uh, now they are environmental refugees and the refu environmental refugees will be increasing. Although they are easy for on uh, as a whole from the global community to avert the situation, but to avert the situation, uh, it is not possible for us immediately to avert the situation. So situation will be deteriorating and environmental refugees will be creating and we have to make the communities resilient to address the issue. In case of Bangladesh, we have already millions of environmental refugees. Why? Because in Bangladesh, uh, this, I mean, uh, uh, rather than sea level rise, we have the problem of uh, uh, erosion of the uh, 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 bank of the rivers. We have uh, three big rivers of the region have flown through Bangladesh, and the weight of these rivers at some places 11 kilometers. So every year, due to soil erosion, there are environmental refugees there. These are environmental refugees who lost their houses due to erosion of the uh, bank of the rivers. And uh, uh, that's why in, in, in the capital and in other big cities like Chittagong and other cities, there are many environmental refugees who are living in the Shantis. So we have to uh, make the communities more resilient. At the same time, we have to uh, focus to avoid the situation. And <clears throat> uh, from the experience of Bangladesh, what we are doing that is more important, I think, and it would be, uh, it would be better to I mean, share our experience and our initiative, what could be taken in other countries. So our government, uh, 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 the government that has taken place uh, on 6th of January this year, just six months, about six months ago, we, have, we are giving a lot of emphasis on the dressing of the rivers. And the dressing of the rivers will increase the carrying capacity of the rivers and thereby will decrease the devastation of the flood. Flood is a regular phenomena in Bangladesh. In some years, about two-thirds of the country goes underwater. For example, in 1998, two-thirds of the country was underwater for about three months. So uh, uh, how to, we cannot prevent the flood. So how to reduce the devastation of the flood? 
Every year we lost from 30,000 crore taka equivalent dino. I don't know exactly how much. Uh, 30,000 crore taka to 50,000.